All right. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Erin from Lattice, and thank you so much for joining today's discussion on making remote work work. Um, we are going to let some people trickle in. I know this is just beginning. Um, so while people are joining, uh, I'd love to draw your attention to the chat feature in the bottom right hand corner. We'll be using this today to interact with each other, ask questions to the panelists, and I'll be moderating some discussion. So to get us started using the chat feature, um, if any, everyone could type in their name, company, and then where you're located, since this is a remote webinar, we'd love to see um, all the locations. So go ahead and chat that, um, and I will start it off. Great, perfect. Wow, thanks everyone for joining. Um, okay, great. So um, before we dive into the actual conversation, I'll intro uh, introduce you to the two host companies for um, this webinar. So again, I'm Erin, I'm the uh, events and webinar person at Lattice. Um, Lattice is a people management company. We do things like performance reviews, goal setting, um, engagement surveys and 360 feedback. And we work with customers like Asana, Slack, and, and WeWork. Um, <laughs> and so the other um, host of this webinar today is Think Human. Think Human is a leadership development and manager training uh, company. They drive change and habit formation. Uh, and some of their awesome customers are uh, Spotify, Snapchat, and SoulCycle. Um, okay, so I'm going to hand it over to Meredith, the uh, CEO of Think Human. Um, but one last chat request before I do: uh, go ahead and tell us about your biggest remote, uh, your, your biggest challenge managing remote teams, and we'll get to that in the Q and A. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Meredith. Uh, thank you so much for hosting. Awesome. Thank you so much, Erin. And hello, everybody. Welcome. We are so happy to have you joining this conversation today. And that we are here to talk about making remote work work. And as Erin said, get into the chat and get your questions, uh, get your questions going uh, now and through the whole rest of the next hour. We have an incredible panel of experts and they're gonna be answering your questions. So this is not TV, don't sit back and just listen, get involved in the conversation. We all know that the world of work has fundamentally changed, that technology has enabled new ways of working and new expectations for how people design their work and, uh, and how people expect their life and their work to uh, intertwine. And for starters, just to find out who's in this conversation with us, if you're somebody who currently works remotely, let us know that, put that in the chat. If you are somebody who works in a company where you don't work remotely, but there's a large remote workforce, let us know that. And if you're somebody who's contemplating having a workforce work remotely or just interested in remote, let us know that. So we have a sense for who is, where you're coming into this conversation. And uh, there's no getting around or avoiding at this point, uh, the world of remote work coming. Remote workforce grew more than 115% since 2005. And just in 2018, it grew by 20%. So those are big numbers. And when given a chance, when employees are given the chance to choose either working remotely or a pay raise, 36% uh, out of a large sample size chose to work remotely. And 30% chose to even be willing to take a pay cut in order to telecommute. So the demand is high. And some progressive workforces, I mean, sorry, workplaces have really embraced this new way of working and are paving the way. And many are seeing the trend, but don't know yet how to manage it well. And for some really good reasons, like how do we hold people accountable when they're not present? And how do you enable a high level of collaboration and a high performing team when people are distributed? How do we create a sense of meaningful connection and belonging among people spread all over the place? So many good questions. And we have this incredible panel here to answer your questions. So panelists, wave when I introduce you so people know who you are. We have Latoya Lin, who's the Senior HR VP for Compass. We have Jocelyn Robancho, Head of People Operations at Lambda School, an e-learning platform. We have Bianca McCann, VP Head of People at Trifecta, and Katie Morrisley, VP of Engineering at Buffer. Hi. Awesome. So 
We're excited to see you in the chat and yeah. questions and let's get started. So we have a question from Lisa uh, and let's start, uh, Katie, with you answering. The question is, what are some of the benefits for the organization on having an employee work from home? So I would say there's two major benefits that we see here. It's a lot easier to hire because if you think about hiring somebody who's the real best person for the job, you're looking at their skill set, you're looking at their cultural contribution. What are the chances that this person is going to be located within four miles of where you're sitting right now versus hiring from that broader pool, whether it is your state, whether it is North America or in Buffett's case, the world. And hiring is one of the most pressing bottlenecks to growth that organizations see. They just can't get to healthy staffing levels. And especially if you're growing fast, you just can't keep up. So making it easier to hire is one of the number one obvious benefits of going remote. When it comes to your current organization, so even if you're not in a growth phase, the benefit there of remote work is it allows people to work from where they are most productive. Remote workers tend to be more productive. I noticed in the chat a lot of how do I measure productivity, accountability. So remote folks are um, not interrupted. And there's been numerous studies, the biggest one being Ctrip, a big Chinese um, travel website that had their call center folks work from home saw a massive 50% increase in productivity. People were working essentially an extra full work day per week. They also noticed higher morale, higher engagement, and um, higher retention for those workers. And I'm sure all of you know, when you're losing an employee, the cost to replace that person, depending on how skilled they are, it can be up to a full year of their salary. So the benefits to the organization of a remote workforce um, is they're more productive, they're more engaged, and you're less likely to lose them. Of course, it's great to come to panels like this because it's not trivial to make it work well. <laughs> Yeah, so thank you so much, Katie. That was a lot, uh, covered many bases. For any of the other panelists, anything you want to add uh, to this question, to Lisa's question about the benefits for the organization of having an employee work from home? I would say that I agree with every point that Katie uh, mentioned, and these are benefits that Lambda School recognizes as well. Um, but just to add on to that, one of the other benefits of hiring remotely is increasing the diversity of life experiences that your employees are bringing uh, mm -hmm. to the company. Uh, by living in, in different regions and areas, uh, they're just bringing that with them every day to the company. So that's another benefit that uh, we see here at Lambda. Love that. So you get more productivity, uninterrupted work, morale, engagement, retention, and diversity of life experience. Anything anybody wants to add? Because uh, if not, I've got one more to chime in, which is just also the lowered overhead of uh, yeah. carrying, the, carrying the office space uh, and all the things that go along with it. So good business case for it. And now let's talk about how do you maintain or establish and maintain accountability in a distributed environment. This is a question from Christy. And uh, Bianca, yeah. how about you jump in first? How do you maintain accountability? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so remote work's uh, an interesting topic. A lot of folks have varying opinions on it, as we know. I'm looking forward to getting into that today. I mean, accountability is about being very clear as to what the expectations are right from the beginning. Uh, I think that actually is something that applies no matter your work location. But for remote employees, especially, there tends to be a bit of tension around, you know, are they actually working? What are they working on? Do, do I have visibility into what they're working on? And also, if I'm a remote employee, people know, do they see me? Do they know what I'm doing? And so on both sides, just being super duper clear on what's expected. Um, and how those things are communicated outwards is really super important. You need more formal structures about that informal stuff that happens naturally on site when you're working with a remote workforce. Do you want to say anything about, you don't have to, but do you want to say anything about those more formal structures that can be helpful that uh, are not necessarily needed in a co-located environment? Yeah, I mean, even just something like a standard weekly check-in with the team, um, where you might not be formalizing that with an on-site team or team member, doing that with a remote employee is going to be really important. It doesn't need to be super, um, super serious, uh, super agenda-oriented, but just checking and making sure that they've got a pretty good flow is important. I think also um, little, little things like 
when we dial into a meeting, uh, we actually ask that remote worker first what they think and putting them forward as a key contributor on the call or on the video. These are small little informal touches, but structurally changing the way that we get work done, communicate our work and assign work, um, just in our sort of micro uh, adjustments throughout our day. We might even overlook those tiny things that can go a long way, but those are a few examples. Great, thank you so much, Bianca. Any of the other panelists want to jump in about establishing and maintaining accountability in a remote environment? Yeah, I'd like to jump in. I think, um, you know, just kind of like picking up what Bianca is sharing is like that structure is really important. Like people, remote employees really need a place to go to in a consistent basis on like where to find information, you know, what's, what's going on, you know, how to be able to, you know, ask questions in the most appropriate time because they, they, they don't really have the, the opportunity for the water, water cooler. Um, what, what we've done historically in other companies I've worked in is that we just have like set meetings where all communication regarding regardless if you're in-house or you're remote, in, is in the same place. There's no like disadvantage or advantage one way or another on either population. I um, mean, that really keeps the, the playing fields really even and remote employees feel like they have like, you know, a seat at the table and they, they get the right information when they need it to be able to act accordingly. Another thing I'd like to add is also the goals are really clear, right? The goal setting is super clear and and very like simple, right? It's, it's not, you know, changing, they have their metrics. And I think once you give them their goals and their metrics, they run very fast. Really, really great. So in the, what I hear both of you, Bianca and Latoya echoing is this idea that activity based management just doesn't work well in this environment, you need result based management. And in order to do that, you have to have really clear, simple, easily to observe results and goals set up from the beginning and then the structures to enable people to get their work done. Katie and Jocelyn, anything that you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I go ahead, Jocelyn. Oh. Um, I was just going to echo something, um, you know, Bianca said that it really comes down to the structure and for, for us where we have some on-site hubs, uh, but most of our workforce is remote working from home. We, those structures of communication, how are we following up on goals? How are we communicating updates? What are these weekly meetings? We actually apply those across the company. So whether you come to a physical office or you're remote, um, all the time, the, the way you update your teams or the company about projects you're working on, how we're tracking goals, is actually the same across the company. So if you have strong accountability folded into the culture of your company, whether you're on site or remote, it actually doesn't matter because the accountability system is strong. Out of curiosity, do you use OKRs or something else? And do you think that matters in terms of having something uniform and a system that people are updating those things in versus verbal updates? Like, do, you, do any of you have a strong opinion about goal management in a virtual environment? We use a combination where, where we have OKRs that are visible across the company um, through uh, Lattice actually, but then we also within our internal teams do daily and weekly updates just with the team. And so there's the larger organization accountability, but there's also the day-to-day, week-to-week accountability within teams of your team members and your managers. And are those uniform across teams? So it's like a norm in the business that there are gonna be weekly accountability updates in every team? Uh, more or less, the, the way that you gather those updates may vary. Are we using them through Lattice? Are we using them through um, a Slack app that updates your team Slack channel? It's, it's more that we are uniform in gathering those updates, but we allow the teams to adapt uh, what is the tool that is best suited for them. That's great. Thank you so much, Jocelyn. And Sarah, out in the community, thank you so much in the chat for defining OKRs, objectives, and key results, and making sure that everybody's brought along in this conversation. Much appreciated. Katie, was there something that you wanted to add about accountability uh, in this kind of virtual or distributed environment? Yeah, I would add that if you are worried about measuring productivity um, with your remote workers specifically, that's a real signal to you that you might be using watching people as a proxy for are they being effective in your organization, which is something to dig into. Do you have a um, remote work problem or more likely, I believe, do you have a trust problem or a hiring problem? Are you not trusting employees to do good work because you're wanting to watch them? Or is it that you're not hiring people that are set up to succeed? You're either not onboarding them in a way that they know what their job is and what their expectations are, or you're hiring people that just aren't trained to do the jobs that you need done. 
Uh, I really uh, want to highlight what you said, Katie. I had heard it once before, and it stuck with me forever. The most remote issues are actually trust and control issues. Can I trust right. people to make decisions? Can I trust them to deal with the situation? Can I trust to share transparently and give access to information? Can I trust that they're even working? So uh, you connected that to a hiring issue. You want to say anything about hiring for this kind of environment and what you think is needed? So we hire remotely because we're hiring folks that are going to work remotely. We don't bring them into on sites um, and meet them in person because with a remote employee, what we care about is how they work remotely, not how they come across in person. They're not going to be in person. Um, we do put a big emphasis on cultural alignment. So we have a full interview that is just dedicated to our company values and how this candidate might be embodying those. And then um, we put a lot of emphasis there on making sure that cultural alignment is there and being very, very clear with our role um, descriptions and role expectations. So we put a lot of effort into our job descriptions and making sure that the candidate understands very transparently what the role is and also what are the difficult, perhaps negative, perhaps messy things about our organization. Um, I strongly believe that it's important not to try to really sell the candidate hard on how you're perfect because they're just gonna end up joining. And if they can't cope with your chaos and cope with your failure modes, you're gonna end up hiring again. So I'm really upfront with, here's the messy, challenging stuff that's not working super well for us right now that we're trying to improve. If you're excited about improving that with me, you're gonna be really happy here and thrive. If that sounds like too much, fair enough. This is probably not the place for you right now. Yeah. Latoya, did you want to say something? Sorry. Yeah, I did. I wanted to jump in. I was just, just thinking what Katie was saying. I, I think, you know, there is a mindset um, around like a, you know, a Frederick terroristic way of thinking, like control and like, you know, very like industrial in the sense of come in, make a widget, leave, the manager watches you, and then you go away. And I, and I think, you know, people are trying, it's like almost this like tectonic plate kind of shifting together, people feeling that way. It's, and then also people like no we're pushing back and remote working is is the way to go and is absolutely the future and i think something that really came up for me that i've seen in my organizations where i have had many conversations with executives like wondering like what do remote workers do like what do they do all day like they're they're like doing their laundry half of the day or they're you know not you know behind the computer grinding because you don't see them and i think there's just a really serious like a serious misconception that we have to be able to kind of address at that level like we just need to change the perception period and then like keep bringing in like use cases of why remote working is the best to do yeah can i jump in on that one too latoya i think one of the a couple of things i um i'm really inspired by the team here a couple things i think uh, mostly remote work is viewed at this point as a benefit more than a competitive advantage or a strategic talent motion and so until we reframe this as not just not a benefit, I mean, it is a bit of a luxury, let's be honest, but if we actually get our minds around the fact that this is a competitive talent strategy, then I think we can begin to shift the conversation. Most folks that are struggling with this discussion are still viewing it as a benefit for folks and then others don't get it. Um, and sometimes I view that as a, as a benefit, right? Like it is pretty awesome to work from home. I'm at home today with my dog and that's pretty nice, but I mostly go in. I'm only home once in a while because that's what works for me. So I think we need to switch the conversation there. And I also think um, Katie mentioned a little bit around the hiring profile around how to bring in remote workers. I completely agree that remote work is not for everyone. Um, some people will succeed in that environment and some do not. There are people who need that uh, support, that mentoring, that onboarding, like different experience to be successful from the beginning and throughout their career but others don't, right? So I'm looking for things like, what are your organizational skills? You know, do you have a self-direction, self-motivation uh, internally? Do your references for the job also say that you do? Um, have you successfully worked remotely before? You know, best predictor of future performance is past performance. These are the kind of things that I'm looking for. And if we can get more successful hires into remote jobs, we can begin to change that conversation around the benefit versus competitive talent strategy. 
Fantastic. I think that uh, the question for me personally in our company, which is totally distributed of self-motivation and do people thrive working on their own and autonomously versus not is another big question that matters for hiring. Because some people think it's like a very nice and sexy idea, but ultimately find it lonely, isolating, even with many opportunities for connection. And we'll talk about that later. Um, how do we create that kind of connection? But I think in my experience, and I would like, love to hear from the rest of the panels, in my experience, some people really are at their best when given the chance to work autonomously and independently. And some people really thrive being integrated into an environment that they're around other people. So any of you want to say anything about that? Actually, Jocelyn, maybe, maybe you want to jump in because you have a unique setup of uh, hubs. Definitely. Um, I would say that that's something that comes up um, fairly often is, you know, uh, for remote workers. I feel a little bit isolated from my team. Um, how do I like form those connections? And we actually encourage that not only through our Slack communications. Um, so we, we have our team channels, but we also have topical channels for staff to connect on things like, do you like cats or dogs or do you go hiking? Um, form these kind of water cooler conversations in an online form. Um, also video calls are, are a great way to connect. Uh, we're not in real life with each other, but I get to see and hear like your voice, your facial expressions, that's another way um, to, to form some connections there. And then as uh, a company that does have some of these natural hubs, uh, we find value in our teams getting together when it makes sense. Um, and so for instance, we have uh, multiple folks uh, from across different teams here with us in the office today, and we're going to leverage that time together, not only to be productive in our work, but socially as well. Um, natural groups form of, hey, let's go to uh, this, a bocce ball place and take a ferry. Like there's different ways to bond or leverage the time that you do have in person that can then um, like you can continue to feed off as when, when you are remote or separate. Um, for example, we had a staff retreat last year, which was the first opportunity everyone in the company met in person for the first time. And that just boosted morale so much and carried us forward, not only in momentum in terms of projects, but in just how we felt about each other. We felt more connected from being together for three days that carried over for months. So Latoya, I know your organization is spread globally. You have offices in many places, so not necessarily just people working from home, but also people distributed in offices around the world. And Katie, you have individual human beings spread around the world. Uh, do either of you want to chime in about bringing people together in person so you can bridge those connections face to face? How often do you think that needs to happen and what needs to happen in those kinds of retreats in order to build the real connections that matter? Absolutely. So Meredith, yes, we bring um, our whole team together, like the entire company once a year. We have people spread out all across the world from Columbus, Ohio, through to Colombo, Sri Lanka. So we get everyone together once a year. And that's very much focused on alignment around our vision as a company, building culture, connecting teammates, making sure that everybody is seeing the bigger picture and also engaging with each other socially. We don't do it more than once a year at this point because at more than 90 people all across the world, it's just really difficult to get everybody into one location. And we alternate those locations between Asia Pacific, then the US, then, the, uh, then Europe every year. So we just had a retreat in San Diego. The next one will be in Europe. Um, and then we do also do small group get togethers, which is very helpful. And that is what for bringing working groups together, for example, a product engineering team or our customer support team. And that is much more focused on getting things done, collaborating, brainstorming, um, doing things that are more difficult to do remotely than in person. So building up that energy and connection as a small team. People do attend at least two onsites per year, spaced out by about six months. And I'd say that's an absolute minimum. We'd like to do it a bit more. It just does get tricky with people's travel schedules and having everybody so distributed. But at least twice a year is probably the minimum I'd recommend there. And especially those small group onsites are really, really valuable. I think an ideal spot, if you could do it, would be once a quarter. Yeah, yeah. And I like to add here for, and what, it's more frequent than um, once and twice a year. It's usually depending on whatever projects need to happen. Um, but I think for the majority of it, like usually the remote working happens and the collaboration happens within like there, you know, in a BC. But when they get together, it's usually for like bonding and connectivity, like personal connections. 
Um, you know, I mean, in no way, you know, remote working can, can make place of that. But I think anytime you do come together, it's really important to try to have those personal connections if you can. Um, and, and they do that more frequently. But going back to and more emphasis more on like developing, you know, connectivity when it comes to like working remotely. But it's really important that folks have a time every now and then frequently to to come together. And they do that quite often, depending on whatever projects they're running. All right, so we have large group get-togethers, whether it's once or a couple times a year, small group get-togethers. I heard video uh, as a great way to just to get people connected virtually. And then uh, I think it was Katie mentioned water cooler conversations and bringing those virtual. And that in a virtual environment, we lack the social grease of walking in from the parking lot together or walking to go grab a coffee together or you know, walking down the hall to get somewhere and the casual chat. So what are the different ways that any of you are creating that kind of virtual water cooler environment to create that social lubrication and connectivity that's not just about a business meeting or getting together in person? Uh, for uh, after our retreat uh, last year, we started to host a, a Thursday evening, um, just a Zoom call where you could come join. We called it uh, Spanish and Rosé. It was a, a joke that uh, came from the retreat, but it was an opportunity for folks just to come in, join a call, and it was just really an opportunity to, to chat uh, about anything and everything. Some, because of the different time zones, some people would be cooking, you know, dinner with their families. Other people would be like later in the evening. So they're just winding down. So you got to see everyone in their, you know, post work state and actually get a window into what their lives are like. Um, some people would share like their children or different activities they were working on. And that's how we discovered that we actually have a lot of dancers at Lambda School. And we're like, okay, great. Can we do a talent show at the next retreat? So we were able to uncover those uh, kind of conversations you you might if you're walking to the parking lot or get, getting coffee, but in a in a remote way. Jocelyn, I thought you were going to say you figured out how to, a way to do a virtual talent show. I was like, that sounds awesome too. I think that's going to be our next challenge at Think Human. I really like that idea. That's a great idea. I think we <laughs> might be able to make that work. Yeah, totally. All right. Other thoughts uh, from the rest of you on virtual water cooler efforts, things that are working. The thing we've got going on right now, which is very popular, is a ongoing Secret Santa type coffee tea exchange where um, we're all posting each other. So one person sends off to one other person and you get one back, either coffee or tea. There's a spreadsheet. You can put what you want. And it kind of sparks like a nice little social discussion of what everyone's discovering. Um, what are we drinking in terms of our favorite beverages here? Um, and there's something nice about receiving something physical that is being sent to you by a teammate. It, it kind of gets things less abstract or sort of off the internet and into that real world space. So that's something that we've just started and it's been really nice. That sounds like a really great idea. Um, I did want to add one more way that we connect uh, virtually. Uh, we use uh, a Slack app called Donut Chats. And so it actually connects you on some cadence you can choose. We do every two weeks with someone across the company and it encourages you to get together and have a conversation. And it's really a neat way, at least for me, to get to know folks that I actually don't interact with a lot day to day. Um, and so it's a way to foster that interconnectedness even across teams. I've used Donut before. I really like it. I've used it in Slack. It's really, really cool. For onboarding, we've used it just to help new people come in. It's a really cool um, bot on, on Slack. Totally agree. Bianca, did you want to jump in with something? Uh, yeah, sure. And actually, Donut's funny. We try, we, this is a great example of like some things work and some things don't. We tried Donut at our company. Did not work. Like I even left. We mm -hmm. just didn't have enough people that were, I know I shouldn't say that. <laughs> You know, we just didn't have enough volume of people that were interested. Yeah. Um, and so just kept picking the same people. It didn't work for us. And so um, that was not a successful event for Trifacta. One thing that we're planning right now, we haven't done it, so check in with me soon. And um, the employees don't even know this yet. Part of our product, what we sell, there's a component called recipes, right? It's like part of what we do and like algorithms. And so we're going to do a virtual and on-site bake-off um, of best recipes where we can engage our global workforce and folks can actually send in the recipes as well as like the picture of what they um, came up with. And uh, we'll have our judging criteria really clear. The winner will be like the of the, of the um, cookbook that will be after that. So we're trying to engage culture and um, some of the product components of what we do. So that's coming soon um, that I think I'll, I'll look forward to doing that. So hold me to it and I'll let you know how it goes. 
Love it. Awesome. So one of the things that came up as all of you were talking was, uh, it just got mentioned a couple of times, was when you're getting people together dealing with time zones. And so let's talk about time zones and meetings for a moment and anything you have learned about what works well. So um, any of you want to jump in or should I pick somebody? Katie, how about you? Yeah. Or one thing that helps us is there's nothing more upsetting as a remote employee of getting a meeting and invite and then it's 2 a.m. your time. You really feel unseen. So we encourage everybody in Google Calendar, which we use to schedule meetings, set your working hours. And then when somebody is scheduling a meeting, they'll get a little pop up that says this is outside of this employee's working hours. And that helps everybody else to be respectful and mindful of that person's time. Of course, sometimes it's really challenging to get a time when everyone can be online at all. And that's when it becomes a conversation of around somebody is going to need to get up early or somebody is going to need to stay on late or um, do something at a bit of a different time. Navigating those conversations, I found it very helpful to rely on a conversation about how flexibility is in general helpful and it'll be a bit of a give and take. So sometimes you'll be getting up at 7 a.m. for a really early meeting, but that means that you're free to go and pick your kids up from school at 2 p.m. and take some time in the afternoon to bake cookies with them. So it's a case where there's benefits and there's trade-offs. You can't insist on a nine to five, like perfect working schedule. And then also as an employee, want the experience of flexibility. It's a case where the company is giving you flexibility and also there are times where we'll ask for flexibility in exchange. I totally agree with Katie. I think, um, you know, my answer is probably pretty unpopular, but that's fine by me. You know, if you're going to be working in an environment that has employees that are located in different areas than your time zone, you will have to be flexible and they will as well. And it, Today, you can't expect to work just traditional hours, um, but a work from home employee does get that flexibility that Katie mentioned. And, and time zone issues are not going away. There's no silver bullet, bullet that's gonna say, you know, yeah, this is, you know, this is the only time that I actually am open to working. That's not reasonable. So um, plan ahead, you know, let folks know that if it's really a, uh, an area of time that is off, completely off limits, maybe your kid has dance recital and like that is totally off, fine, like just be communicative and, and if you're gonna be blocking time, um, make sure that you're clear about why you're blocking that time and just stick to it. But ultimately you will have to flex at some point. You know, I've been on calls, you know, for 15 years I've been doing these things. And you know, if you have to run a meeting at 2 a.m., you have to run a meeting at 2 a.m. Otherwise don't work there. Something I really appreciate about, oh, sorry, go ahead, Jocelyn, please go first. Um, I was going to say, at least for Lambda School, uh, we operate on Pacific time, uh, and so those are our core business hours, and we do have folks across the United States, and for our East Coast uh, employees, we work out, okay, well, it doesn't necessarily, you know, you don't want to be online from 11 to uh, 8 p.m. every day, but what are the core hours in which we can overlap? And so although we all operate on Pacific time, and so there's no uh, confusion when you're setting up meetings, we're like always operating on this, we do allow for the, the meetings um, that happen, like reoccurring meetings, we try to time them when there's the overlap. Uh, and then separately, we also have a workforce in the EU, and so um, that becomes the standard time for anyone over there. And then we look to have, when our EU team needs to collaborate with our uh, US team, we try to find the times when it overlaps. And that's how we've kind of built in flexibility within the company structure. But I agree there needs to be flexibility on both sides, especially for, for different projects, people's schedules get full. And we found that when uh, individuals and teams feel connected to each other, you can actually leverage those personal relationships to have that flexibility. So it doesn't become necessarily a company mandate, it becomes something that we want to do because we see and identify with those other employees and we want to make it work for both of us. Yes, flexibility is uh, getting highlighted by all of you. The flexibility, the benefit of the flexibility of getting to be remote and the flexibility that we generate. Um, something I've seen that I really appreciate, especially in companies that have really thriving cultures, is that they rotate the time zone of their company meetings when they have people spread across the globe so that you don't have the same group of people always making the concession. But some of the time, you know, Australia is having to get up in time for a, a meeting in, you know, in the States. And some of the time, the States is having to get up in time for a meeting in Asia or Australia. And uh, that shift uh, creating a, a sense of inclusion and equity across the whole organization. Um, 
Let's talk for a minute about asynchronous work. We're talking about meetings. How are you see, how are you managing asynchronous work well? What are the tools? What are the ways you have people collaborating? Katie, do you want to jump on that? So we have a brand new asynchronous tool, which we're loving. It's called Threads, like sewing thread, cotton thread. Mm -hmm. um, and for us, it's been replacing our notice board tool, discourse, and also email. We're typically not using email um, company-wide internally. Of course, we still use email with people outside the company. Um, but we're encouraging a lot of discussion to be on threads. And of course, in engineering, we have a lot of discussion happening on GitHub that's close to the code. Um, we use Dropbox paper documents for making decisions asynchronously. People can weigh in and make comments. And then a quick note about Slack. A lot of people like to make decisions on Slack. That is synchronous decision making. It's written but it's not asynchronous. If you do make decisions on Slack, you need to be aware that either everybody needs to be online and aware that they're expected to be in that chat or don't make the decision in Slack. If it needs to be synchronous, make it in a meeting, or if it can be asynchronous, move it to a place that's actually asynchronous. If you end up making those decisions in Slack, people are forced to choose between constantly watching Slack or getting their work done. And as a manager, that's not a choice you want people to be making because there's no win there. Um, it's such a great point. Thank you for highlighting that, Katie. And can you just say again how you do it in Dropbox for anybody that wants to use the tool in that way? How are you doing asynchronous decision making? Yes, it's called Dropbox Paper. That's the tool we use. We'll create a paper document and it will usually be a request for comment on some kind of proposal or decision. Somebody would say, I want to propose this. And they'll say, it's a request for comment. I'm looking for advice from the following people at mention them. You'd say, what is the problem I'm solving? What are my solution? What are any alternatives I have considered? And then you'll say thoughts below. It's really important there that you put a deadline. I need input by tomorrow, by Thursday, et cetera, because otherwise you're endlessly waiting as people weigh in on your dock for days and days. Um, you say, who exactly do you want input for, from? Because otherwise everybody is going to jump in or nobody will get the bystander effect. So say I want input from, you know, Latoya, Bianca and Aaron. Um, and then it's totally appropriate to nudge people on your document as well. If you're not getting a turnaround on your asynchronous decision-making that you need, follow up with your teammates because asynchronous decision-making, a big trap there is it ends up taking really long as people, oh yeah, I felt about my to-do list. I didn't end up getting to it. Whereas synchronous decision-making doesn't tend to have that problem, which is I think why a lot of decisions end up made in Slack because at the end of the day, people just need input so they jump into Slack just to get it done, knowing that it's not a great way to make those decisions. Got it. Um, thank you for uh, clarifying that for all of us. And now let's talk about uh, environments where you have people in office and remote and how to manage those meetings best. They are tricky. We all know the experience of being, you know, the, the uh, what you call it, the speakerphone in the center of the room and you can barely hear the person who's trying to talk and they can hear only yeah. a thousand voices at once. So who, which one of you wants to jump yeah, in? I can, yeah, I can totally jump in on that. That is something that we are super cognizant um, at our company today is because we have so many distributed teams and whenever we have meetings, it's like, you have like a meeting for like 30 minutes and you're like, gosh, you turn around and say, hey, does anyone on the VC have a comment? Um, what we do proactively in our current organization is we start with the, the people that are remote and we, I think we mentioned this before too, and have them kind of lead the conversation, ask questions back into the room. And what my role in that is really facilitating and what leaders are doing is facilitating the conversation back and forth, just allowing just some cross collaboration. So people remotely, you know, don't feel left out. Another thing that we do around training is that I see a lot of leaders are, are you know, teams will do trainings, a blend of both remote and um, in office, in space. It's a different type of, you know, connectivity that you need to pay attention to that. So what we do is we split our trainings to remote trainings only, same content, but delivered very differently with virtual icebreakers so people can feel connected that way and then separate our remote, our in-house people or in, in room people to do a different experience, um, but same content. Bianca, anything you want to add? I know you have also a blended environment. Yeah, I mean, blended environments can be a little bit of a challenge. I think the team covered most of it here. I mean, ultimately, you're going to try to find things that are bridging. Um, 
you know, I probably don't have anything additional to, um, to add to LaToya's comment. I generally agree with LaToya's comments, actually, I find. Um, one thing I will say, we talked about earlier some of those informal ways to connect and bridge. Something that's really simple um, that I might recommend that I have not done here, so I need to hold myself accountable to implementing those, or how can you have a consistent thread through the meetings that you're having? Um, so for example, do you start every meeting with, uh, at Chevron, we used the safety moment because that was a cultural component of what we were doing. Um, if you're a company dedicated to diversity, that's wonderful. Maybe you can start every meeting, no matter what that meeting is, with a diversity moment. Um, maybe you're a company that's trying to create a culture of feedback or recognition. Um, and so maybe taking a moment to do a shout out at either at the end or the beginning. Consistent themes throughout the experience of the employee, no matter where they are, are a bridging tactic. I call it like a connective tissue. So other than that, though, I agree with the team. Love that. Uh, bridging tactic. Uh, thank you. That's a good one for me. So, uh, oh yeah, go ahead, Jocelyn. I'd say uh, one thing that we do for, for virtual meetings when people are tuning in, um, it can be as simple as placing the computer where their uh, remote, remote face is at a seat where it is like they are there present still at the table. Um, so even though their physical body is not there, they're still represented in that way or providing them a view where maybe they're, they're up on a TV. It's like a head of table kind of view and they can still see everyone. And so they're able to capture and see the facial expressions. Um, and there's also a, uh, a tool called meeting owl that will kind of like span the room, uh, to, to, uh, zoom in on the person that's actually speaking in the, the physical room. So you get that kind of perspective as well. Cool. Katie? Yeah, something we do um, when we do have a bunch of folks together in one location and other people joining remotely is we'll have everybody join the meeting from their own computer on a Zoom link. So the meeting is a virtual meeting and it's sort of virtual first, remote first. Um, this can be tricky if you've got a huge meeting and a lot of people in one room. How we navigate that is everyone use headphones so there's not feedback. When you're not speaking, mute yourself. And use general good meeting etiquette. Don't talk over your person that's talking. Um, that should be um, how you're running meetings anyway. So that can work even if you are all in one room. And what that does is it brings the entire meeting remote rather than it's an in-office meeting that you're trying to make work for a remote person. One experience I once had that was terrible was being the sole remote participant in a otherwise in-office meeting. And somebody like carried me around the room on the laptop um, and I couldn't really participate. And I felt like I was being dragged around by this man. It was just really awful. <laughs> so harassment did you? Really yeah. Awful. That's very funny. But I mean, he was just carrying a laptop, but I really had yes. that yet. <laughs> um, all right. So how do we include remote workers in office celebrations? When you're not in, once again, a question for blended or distributed teams that are not entirely distributed. Thoughts on that? Yeah, um, we recently, um, in my organization, we did a whole charity event. So what we did was we picked a day. Um, we picked a day and we pretty much had everyone like do something that day that was obviously a theme across the entire, you know, company and organization. And that was definitely, you know, people like coming together for an, an all company celebration. Not that all companies to be in the same space, but it was the same theme across different markets. And that was really cool. Awesome. I love that Sandy is telling us in the chat that her company sends gift cards when there's an in-office fun event so people at home get to experience it. Love that. Uh, Jocelyn, Bianca, any other thoughts from you? So I think there, there are some different ways to do that. One can be, you know, if it is an in-office event, still inviting all your, of your remote workers so that they know that they were thought of and included. You know, they might not be able to attend, but at least they're still in the loop about something that is happening. Uh, and then also on the other side, like, is it possible to time some of those in-person celebrations when your remote workers are going to actually be in town, if that's something that your company does? And that's another way to bring that celebration together. Um, or sometimes, you know, can you set up a Zoom TV somewhere so they're still able to participate in some way and interact with, with the group uh, is another way to kind of create a blended uh, environment, if you will. Yeah, I can add a little bit. I mean, I think it's, um, it's pretty challenging to create and replicate an on-site experience in a remote environment. And so, you know, ultimately, I think pro probably focus less on trying to replicate and focus more on creating inclusion. So a couple of things come to mind for me, which is like, maybe you didn't get to go to the Thursday happy hour 
on site at the SF office, but maybe we have a stipend for you to have a happy hour with an employee that is co-located near where you are. Sometimes bringing visibility to our employees that there are actually people in the vicinity um, where they are is really, really important. And so I don't think enough companies do that to create bridging, um, co-location and geographic bridging where possible. So that's kind of an idea. I mean, I think the other um, thing I'd recommend is um, understanding how remote employees feel socially connected. Maybe they don't care, they miss the happy hour, they just miss like engaging with people. Maybe they want a WeWork stipend because they want to actually just work in an environment that has like a little bit of bustle. Maybe that's more important to them than having a few drinks. Um, so I think just don't assume that that on-site event is necessarily missed. Think about um, what pieces of that event are missed, like the connection to a, the, and replicate that, the connection to an employee, you can create that in different ways. I've done virtual happy hours where I connect virtual employees to one another and they can like have a little glass of wine, you know, over Zoom, as silly as that sound, even um, co virtual coffee, you know, you're doing this. There is, a, there is a component of just feeling like someone sees me. So don't worry about the event, worry about what, is, what are they missing out of the event and replicate that piece. Really brilliant and helpful. Uh, anybody have anything else they want to add about celebrations? No. All right. So let's talk for a minute about uh, if there's anything you want to say, Latoya, I know you had to take yourself off video so that we can hear you well, but is there anything you want to say about remote workers across 25 countries with many cultural differences? I don't know if you feel like we already handled that with the time zone issue, but I want to throw that out there if there's anything you want to add. Latoya, are you there? Are you muted? Did we lose you? All right. Well, here I am. I'm here. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, yeah, something around cultural differences. I mean, I had an opportunity to work and 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 for a company where I was able to kind of change the culture and like change the motto and everything like that and went around the, the world to different offices to kind of connect that. And the one theme that I got from that, and obviously they're remoted from HQ in several different countries, is that simplicity is best, right? And and also having folks have the ability to translate it within their own market and with their own culture um, that's also something really important so for example if you have like a particular motto or a way of working or whatever the case is that that same like you know parallel should happen within their region and their market so they'll be able to kind of have their own sense of connectivity to it yeah it seems like that really underlines bianca's same point which is don't try to replicate the exact same thing look for what's underneath it and then figure out how to express that underlying sentiment in a way that like relevant for that remote group so that's great um let's talk for a minute about what are companies doing to support remote workers home office environments such as equipment special perks uh jocelyn you want to speak to that yeah so uh we have a, a slew of remote benefits and some of those things in terms of equipment there's certain things that we'll provide up front you know like uh, for instructors it's a laptop uh, microphones webcams but we also offer all employees a stipend to uh per like purchase office things to make their home office work for them uh where it's like you have this dollar amount and go spend it uh and that and that's what you use with it um, other things that we do are, you know, internet is very important uh, for remote workers. So uh, we have a stipend to cover um, X amount of dollars of your internet every week. Um, working at home can sometimes, you know, that was that line of I work at home and I also live at home. You know, it is nice. Uh, Bianca said this, like maybe they need some social interaction. So we also have a stipend if you want to go work out of a coffee shop or uh, purchase a co-working uh, day pass. Um, you can expense that. There's a, a different events that way. Um, or things like uh, a, a gym membership. It can go towards a membership or equipment, just something to get you outside and moving. Um, those are a few of the, the kind of unique benefits we offer uh, as a remote company. And are those only for people who are remote or people who work in your hubs can also get access to those same benefits? So that's a very great question. It's available to all of our employees. Uh, and Part of that is because we do have these natural hubs uh, in SF and in Utah, uh, but no one's required to work out of those hubs specifically. It's more of people come and want to work there uh, from time to time. So the folks in our hubs actually varies day to day. Gotcha. So really everybody is distributed. Um, any other thoughts? Bianca, you want to jump in? Yeah, I actually have two, but they're not about equipment necessarily in the home. Um, the first thing is make sure you have proper tech support at your company if you're going to have a remote workforce. 
who cares if you have a laptop and a video camera if it doesn't work? Um, it's really important that stuff is functioning and that when it goes off kilter, there is someone helpful to get that thing back online. That's super duper helpful. The other thing I'd say is um, on the company side, ensure that you have invested in proper infrastructure that you do, that you can handle you know a lot of uh, dial-ins for example or that when videos are streaming the bandwidth does not create pixelation and a delay like make sure you've got the right infrastructure and that you're delivering on the support that the tech uh, that, that the tech is needing for uh, in office um, operation thank you awesome I want to just reference a question from Greg who's in the chat asking if you have links to any studies that can be shared with executives something that can help kick off a conversation so if you do Katie I see you nodding if you can either drop that in the chat or tell us what that is any of you for that matter uh, but for everybody who's listening who's looking for how to ignite this conversation and help make the business case yes we have more people chiming in yes please <laughs> yes executive buyouts buy-in so well, while you're dropping in links and sharing about that, I have another question from, uh, from the community, which uh, is related to burnout. I know Gallup's State of the American Workplace report found that on average, remote workers work at least four hours per week more than do their co-located counterparts. So uh, if you get the hiring right, overwork is more of an issue than underwork with a distributed workforce. So what are some suggestions for balancing work life for people who work from home, who there in some ways is no end to their work day? So one thing that we do is we encourage leaders to end off at the end of the day and role model having work life boundaries and say, I am signing out now or I'm going on vacation and I won't take my laptop. Another thing we like to do is in our daily standups that we'll have in our teams, we will check in. Did you work what did what did you work what felt to you like a reasonable number of hours yesterday? Mm. Or did something crop up and you felt like you overextended yourself? And if somebody says, oh, I, I work quite a lot, the response there is not any kind of judgment, oh, you're working too hard or are you slacking off. It's just a question of what is your plan to restore your energy today? And that helps to just to nudge people back into, we want to just work a reasonable amount and we trust our teammates. A lot of this does go back to trust. Um, so if you are noticing that people are working really long or you seem to um, get signs in your one-to-ones in your engagement surveys that burnout is an issue for you, then there might be some conversations to be had, very candid conversations of, do you feel like you need to prove yourself? Do you feel like you're being watched all the time? What is at the root of this overwork? Um, in my experience, remote workers will assume that people think they're flack, slacking off unless proven otherwise. And the burden of proof is then on the worker to prove beyond all doubt that they were not watching Netflix, which can end up being an unhealthy dynamic. Anything anyone else wants to add, Jocelyn? Are you coming in? Um, there's some, some tactical ways uh, to do that. It can be pausing your inbox so no new, new things are coming in after hours. Um, if we're a very Slack heavy organization um, and I set do not disturb for notifications uh, from 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. So it's just, uh, it creates a social contract where if someone's going to push that notification to me, they know that they are interrupting my off time. Um, and also similarly on Google calendars, if you're, if you have your work hours established there, um, and kind of do that. Uh, and then I would say some of that might be working individually with the employees. Um, like Katie said, maybe you actually are deep diving into why is someone working so, so much after hours, um, and helping them, uh, protect time for themselves as well, as well. And that's a conversation that you can be having between, with your manager. Bianca, anything you want to add? Yeah, I mean, work, remote workers, the two biggest challenges that you face if you, re, if you do read the studies, it's loneliness and burnout, right? These are the two key issues that managers are dealing with. You know, ultimately, um, what I think what happens for remote workers is a lot of them because it's viewed as a benefit and a luxury, and sometimes I view it that way too, but honestly, it is a member of strategic talent imperative. They, they overexert themselves because they have this like indebted feeling to their employer, which is a good thing. There's a loyalty there. But when they do that, like ultimately that's, that's their behavior. Their, their behavior is about like, I want to express gratitude for this thing. And so I'm working a lot or a manager might not understand work from home because they haven't managed someone like that before and maybe giving them work that like can't be reasonably done, but they assume they're working from home. So maybe it's easier for them to do it. There are things like that. So Number one, the remote worker is responsible for their schedule. Again, a very unpopular answer. You wanna manage your calendar, you gotta manage it yourself. No one else cares about your calendar more than you do. The more you let your calendar slip, 
the further little inch goes a mile. If you are done at your day at six, except sometimes you take that call from Singapore at night, fine, then you build it into your calendar. But ultimately it is your responsibility to manage your own calendar. For my team, you know, we go very hard during the work week. I will not lie. I'm super intense and like, it's a hard work week, right? It's a lot, but we all do it. And so I do a few things. Number one, I do not bother my team on the weekend, no matter what. Unless it's life limb or someone's kid is injured. We do not, I do not let them work on the weekend ever. I take them out once a quarter for an event that does not allow them to use a laptop because they can't tear themselves away. Like a dark movie like the museum, things like this, where they cannot work. Um, and so, you know, I really protect their weekends because I can't give them everything during the week. And the other thing I'm doing on my team is I've offered like a 980 schedule because they take a Friday off twice a month. They actually don't want to, they rejected it. They said they don't want to do that. So I'm forcing one Friday off every other month at a minimum. Um, and for unlimited PTO, that is huge burnout central because people don't want to take time off, especially remote workers. Make a requirement. My team, I, they are required to take three weeks of vacation a year, period, no exceptions, and they cannot come to work. You mean business, I love it. All right, <laughs> anybody else have anything they wanna to add to that? No, all right, so we have uh, a question about ERGs, which I think is really interesting. I don't know if any of you have tackled this, but how to have ERGs in a remote environment or include pe people in a remote environment in an ERG that might be co-located. And employee ERGs are employee resource groups, so uh, affinity groups for people of a certain cultural background or um, uh, identity group. Uh, so any experience with uh, employee resource groups um, in a virtual environment? No, nobody. All right. It looks like that's something we're gonna have to solve for. Yeah, Bianca, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, when I was at SAP, SAP is a really large company. It's very much a remote company. It's a fantastic culture, like just an awesome employer. I loved working there. One of the things that was really interesting to me from an employee sort of a network group or resource group, they had virtual chapters. So ultimately we had chapters at different locations and different hubs, but there was always a virtual chapter, no matter the ERG. And in many cases, those were the busiest because we were very much a remote culture. Um, our issue was making sure people understood there was a virtual chapter. So like marketing that and bringing visibility to that being an option, that was where we needed to do more work because many folks did not know that existed. And if you're gonna have a virtual chapter, treat it as you would any chapter. They get a budget and they get the chance to come together at some point, just like other groups get to do. Love it. Okay, great. So final question for all of you, everybody chime in one by one. If people listening today are gonna to do just one single thing coming out of today's webinar, if they're gonna take just one new action, what is that one piece of actionable practical advice that you would have them do? And Latoya, let's start with you. Yeah, so, you know, my one, the one action is really just changing, helping leaders change the mindset of what remote workers are all about. If you want to move very fast in your company, you know, getting people, you know, someone very quickly remotely, it will, will greater your chances of being very successful quickly. Um, because I really believe that the remote workers are the new introverts of companies and we need to kind of really pay attention to that. Love that expression, Latoya. That's awesome. That's a keeper. All right, Katie, how about you? I would say moving your communication online to level the playing field between your in-office folks and your remote folks. So get every, all the salient work conversation happening on the internet. Whichever tool you use, that's the first step. Level the playing field. All right, Jocelyn. Um, I would say when you are thinking about remote workers and accountability, uh, put the onus on looking at what are the, the company's accountability structures and how are you tracking things internally rather than putting it on the remote workers and approaching it as a remote work problem. It's actually a company problem that uh, would apply to all of your employees. Oh, juicy, I like that, thank you. And Bianca, bring us home. Yeah, I think, you know, don't assume you know what the problems are. I mean, ask the various, you know, demographic groups, like the employees, the managers, and even colleagues, get their opinion on how it's going and how we can improve. Don't assume people are lonely, like they might not be. Don't assume they're burnt out, they might not be. Or those might be massive issues that you have to go tackle. So prioritize and really get insight as to what the issues are um, before you start making a bunch of actions that might not be that useful. Not everybody needs a box full of like, you know, cooking gear if that doesn't matter to them. So right size the problem and put the right interventions in place. So good, thank you so much. To every one of you panelists, 
thank you so much for sharing your experience, your wisdom, your road tested, uh, real tried and true uh, experience with us. We so appreciate it. And to everybody in this community, thank you so much for your fantastic questions and contributions. Go make your version of this real in the world. And thank you. Have a beautiful rest of your day.